lot of bubbles. A lot of bubbles. You're not foreign to bubbles, right? <laughs> <laughs> She's very capable, my mother. She loved to eat and she loved to cook. My mother was from Louisiana and she didn't know how to boil water. Probably like you did when you started in the restaurant business. When you put them in the pan, you can see they all go whoop. They tighten up a little. Crispy Szechuan duck from the Mandarin and lemon pepper duck from restaurant Gary Danko. She was born almost a hundred years ago in a China that no longer exists. Her privileged childhood was interrupted when the Japanese invaded and she was forced to flee, and then flee again when the communist revolution swept over China. But Cecilia Chang is a survivor, and in the 1950s, she sailed into San Francisco. Though she had never cooked a day in her life, she opened the Mandarin, an acclaimed restaurant that would revolutionize Chinese food in America. She mentored some of America's greatest chefs, the likes of Julia, James Beard, and Alice Waters. Now in her mid-90s, Cecilia is mentoring a new generation of San Francisco's chefs and sharing her century of kitchen wisdom. I was born 1920 and the uh, year of a monkey. <laughs> that time just the uh, end of the Qin Dynasty and the start of the Republic of China. Sun Yat-sen was the revolutionary. He was the one started to overthrow the Qin Dynasty and start the Republic of China. My grandmother was raised in a brief window of time in Chinese history. After 2,000 years of imperial rule, she and her 11 siblings were growing up in a republic. Though it was to be short-lived, for Cecilia, it was a time of personal liberation. Like her mother, she became a feminist before there was such a thing. And like all her brothers and sisters, my grandmother was educated in the best schools in Beijing, where she picked up an English name. I went to a Catholic University in Beijing, and all our professors are uh, foreigners, you know, some from America, some from uh, uh, Germany, French, so they cannot remember the student Chinese name. Your name Anita, your name is Cecilia. So I got my name Cecilia. Of the nine daughters in the family, it was Cecilia who would follow in her mother's footsteps, later running the Mandarin in San Francisco, just as her mother had run the sprawling compound in Beijing. She was a very strong woman, actually. In those days, especially, Father usually always the the boss, you know, take care of everything. But you know, my, my my mother was the boss. We know she's from a very wealthy family. She has sisters and the brothers, but they all died very young. That's what we know, because they are from wealthy family. They all open smoker. When she was uh, thirteen years old. Her parents died, her sister, brother, all, all died. She, has, she had to take over the whole household. She's very capable, my mother. She can do a lot of things. She made, when we were kids, she made our shoes. She loved to eat and she loved to cook. She's very short and very chubby. Because she's so short, she had to get on the stool because she can reach the stove. She had um, a pork dish for New Year time. That preparation, I think, probably couple, at least a couple of weeks. Use the pork belly, slice very thin. Every day steam one hour, 
then quote. And later on, this um, pork belly fat, just like glass, you can see through. And it's not uh, really you feel like fat at all. And it's so delicious. She make her own ham at home. And then she used the head, the ears, the pig's head, pig's ear, even the pig, the pig's tail, make all different dishes. <laughs> Food wasn't all that her mother taught her. Though they were a prosperous family with servants to take care of their every need, her mom also taught her lessons that would prepare my grandmother for the adversity that lay ahead. I remember when we were in, uh, started to go to college, and she told the ser servant, she said, don't make the bed for Miss Number Seven, because they're in college now. They have to learn how to make their own bed. But usually, the servant did all that, so my mother said, no more. You're now in the college, you have to learn how to do certain things. And she always said, uh, you are very lucky, have servants and all good living, good food. You have learned something, prepare someday. You, you cannot afford to have all the, the servants, something like that. But a lot of things she said to us, and how be a, a good person, be honest, and how you treat people. I think that really helps a lot. What now, what now? Like my grandmother, Gary Danko learned all about food from his mom. Unlike my grandmother, Gary got an early start in the kitchen and then never left. Dining at Restaurant Gary Danko is a San Francisco rite of passage, and reservations are coveted like winning lottery tickets. The food there is classic and yet modern, indulgent and yet light. Danko mixes luxury ingredients from around the world with ones that are locally sourced. It's refined, sophisticated cooking with bold flavors his mother Opal taught him long before he became one of San Francisco's most respected chefs. The suited waiters and captains carry out service that matches the food, impeccable without a trace of pretension. Restaurant Gary Danko is impeccable because Gary Danko wouldn't have it any other way. A lot of bubbles. A lot of bubbles. You're not foreign to bubbles, right? <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. To long life. And good health. And to great health, yes. A lot of love, too. Yes. Well, now I want to ask you how you started. Well, actually, it would be my mother. Um, you know, I have a lot of female influence in my cooking. Mm -hmm. You know, because I grew up in a large family, not quite as big as yours, seven children, including myself. Mm -hmm. And then my two parents and my grandfather, my Hungarian grandfather lived with us. You're Hungarian? Hungarian, uh-huh. The Hungarians do a lot of foie gras and duck and all That's that. That's right, the rich food. So anyhow, my father built houses, and so my two older brothers are, we're all a year and a half apart. And so mm -hmm. when they were young, like six or seven or eight, mm -hmm. they would go to work with my father, and there was no room for the third one. So I stayed home and learned how to cook. Mm -hmm. Like my mother was from Louisiana, and she didn't know how to boil water, probably like you did when you started in the restaurant business. <laughs> but, you know, seven kids, ten mouths to feed. Um, mm -hmm. She learned how to become a very good cook. And one of the most important things I learned as a child was how to balance flavors. And very simply, she used salt and she used acid. You know, very southern, they don't use a lot of spices, they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically, it, that's how I got my start. How does it feel to be back in a restaurant kitchen? I love to get back to the kitchen. Well, it's you have good. more energy than most people I know, so. <laughs> You're going to the work, so I do all the talking. Exactly, uh, so. Actually, the duck in China is quite expensive. Use a lot of people cannot afford it. 
to your stuff. Uh -huh. And well, this you... is your native duck. This is the Pekin duck, which is in the U.S. known as a Long Island duckling. They grow basically in California and in New York. Mm -hmm. And so these are the ones that they do the typical tea smoked duck with, everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you chose the um, Moscovy duck today. Mm -hmm. This is a very ornery duck, and I find the breast and the meat to be tougher. Yeah. Typically when you have a tougher meat, you have more flavor. Mm -hmm. But today, you've kind of reinvented yourself, and you're only going to use the breast today, right? Yeah, because I think most of people want to try to do something uh -huh. at home. And this is <laughs> too much and too much work for them. Right, and so, you can buy the breast already boned out, so that makes right. it easier. Yeah, make sure so would you have done easier. the recipe with the whole duck, yes. steamed it, and then... Yes, in the old days. In the Mandarin, we'll do the whole duck. Uh -huh. And also, only for the banquet. Uh-huh, for and banquets. you cut in beautiful small pieces, put on a big platter, right. and then serve. And so you would serve that banquet. cut up with a lot of many, many other dishes, right? That's, That's part right. of the banquet. That's so. one of uh -huh. the, the duck. So anyhow, today we're going to depart from it, I guess, and we're going to take the bone out. The Americans don't like bones. Uh-huh, exactly. <laughs> and also, you're leaving the skin on your breast, and I'm going to take mine off, because I always find it impossible to cook a duck breast medium rare and then have yeah. crispy skin. I know you've told me many, many times that young people keep you young. That's um, right. Do you mind if Tori, my sous chef, comes in and oh, sh no, you show him some all. of your wisdom Welcome. as well? You remember Cecilia? Yeah, so nice Tori. to see you again, Cecilia. Nice How are you? I think I saw you pinching his butt last time. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> so keeps you young, I think, right there. <laughs> all right, well, let's go on with your recipe because I'm excited to learn it. And I know Tori is excited as well, so. Absolutely. Good, good. Today, you're doing Chinese five spice? Yes. I don't even know the English name of this. But in China, it's Xiao Hui Xiang Da Hui Xiang. Keep <laughs> I know, going, I love it. <laughs> I know all the Chinese names. But so are you anyway, giving the English name? Yeah, so <laughs> cumin, fennel seed, coriander. A oh, coriander. Mm -hmm. Clove, Clove, star anise, and cinnamon. So basically, we would grind all these spices and then make a powder? Yeah, make uh -huh. a powder, then you wrap it uh -huh. uh, inside the duck. And if you hold the duck, you wrap inside and outside. Uh -huh. And besides that, you need some salt. What about toasting the spices? They toast it in a dry wok. They pound it first, then they put it in, uh, in the wok uh -huh. and they chow. So what region is this from? This dish is from Sichuan. Sichuan is in the middle of uh, the inland. They don't have too much seafood. Uh -huh. So they use the duck and chicken uh -huh. and the pork a lot. But uh -huh. the, the province is bad weather, very humid uh -huh. and hot. So they like to use a lot of spice and some really the pepper. Mm -hmm. So make you perspire. Uh -huh. After that, then you'll feel cool. cool. <laughs> So back to the duck, so, your mother used to dry duck, right? Like air dry it? Yes. Like chicken? Yeah, so my mother would dry the fish, wouldn't dry the fish, wouldn't dry the chicken, wouldn't dry the, the duck, and also the vegetable, a lot of vegetables. So you would dry like cabbage? You can dry Chinese Napa cabbage, uh -huh. and also the Shanghai little, the green cabbage, those are Last for a long, long time. So are you cooking in woks, or you have an oven, or, because I'm trying to no paint a oven. picture back. In China, we have no oven. No ovens, right? At all. Everything is on the burner, uh -huh. on top of the burner. Mostly, either use coal in the old days, no natural gas, or wood. All right, Cecilia, we're going to embark on your recipe, so. Well, let's do the. We're going to let Tori do some of the work here. So this is typically the type of onion you would use in China, like a yes, that's spring a, onion like or a scallion. And what about the ginger? Okay. How do you peel ginger? I'm always curious. Yeah, like, you can use a spoon. spoon. And now I have a bowl to combine all the, yeah, that's right. the, the five spice. Yeah. How does that smell? It's just that's lovely. A, it's very sweet. That's spice. Mm -hmm. And then the shaoxing you cook in That's a This is a... It's like a sherry. Yeah, a little sweet. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big combination. And just right in? Yeah. Wow. Coat it? Yeah, that's right. Beautiful. Beautiful duck breasts, aren't they? Beautiful. And how long will you let More these flavor. marinate? You usually, you have to marinate it about four hours even. Sometimes you cook 
nighttime when you have nothing to do, then maybe you just uh, avoid Easier overnight. Better. Overnight, overnight. That's exactly. Right. All right, so here's our breasts that have been marinating overnight. You suggested we brush a little soy. I said brush it on top, okay. yeah. Putting a little bit of makeup on, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It adds color warm, and some yeah, salt yeah. and some And also have umami. a little more flavor. Uh -huh. oh, I right think in. we can, we can put okay. it in, yeah. So it, when you were doing this in a restaurant, you would have multiple baskets on top of each That's other? That's right. Big we ones, used right. to put four ducks uh -huh. in the steam. Four ducks? Four uh -huh. whole ducks. Very efficient way of cooking, because steam is hotter than direct cooking. That's right. That's but right. if you can go yeah. layer upon layer. The layer in layer. Uh -huh. Because the, the heat is going up. Basically, this is steamed for 30 mm -hmm. minutes, and then we're going to chill them down, and I'll then chill it down. and then, then come to the final fry. part where we're going to fry them till they're crispy. Right. All right, so we're going to drop those into a little bit of soy hissing there, but yeah. it'll be gone soon. So these cook for about two, three minutes, Cecilia. Or yeah, then you you have to turn because okay. you want to make it crispy. But this Chinese, when the way cook the duck, not pink. Uh-huh, they don't like, like it pink, uh-huh. We don't like it pink. <laughs> it's turning oh, beautiful color. That? Yeah, turn them. Give it a little flip. No, not too many yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because it's supposed to be crispy. Crispy, exactly. How do you tell when they're done? Our kitchen always have a little chopstick. We oh, you do? Use a chopstick to poke it. When you can poke through, that means it's done. Poke through they're done? Yeah. Yeah, getting there. Yes, getting there. So what do you serve these with? You would bring them out, let them rest, and then this slice This is actually, them. you can slice it. Uh-huh. You can use a it little as an appetizer. Uh-huh. See how beautiful that it is, beautiful. is, the color? Very nice and crisp. Yum. Yeah. All right, we'll just take a little slice off. It can still probably, you try. try. Bite. You try. Mm. Woo! Ah. <laughs> Flavor is delicious. Mm -hmm. Good, nice very flavor. Good. good. Mm. Marinade on it's very good. Very good flavor. The mm. best part is the skin. <laughs> <laughs> Notice who jumps right in and eats it. I love that. <laughs> we need more wisdom. More. <laughs> How many of your siblings are still around? I have only one sister now. Only still one out living. Of... The one we walk from Beijing to Chongqing. Uh -huh. Sister number five. That was a life-changing experience, obviously. Right now, my sister's still living, 102. Really? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I have my Pekin duck breast. Uh, Since I'm removing the duck skin off of this, mm -hmm. what I want to do is replace it with a crust that will help it cook more evenly, but Even. will also impart flavor into it. This is a half a cup of parsley. We have some dried thyme here. And then this is going to be a black pepper crusted. So mm -hmm. this is what you would call in French mignonette, which is the coarsely this cracked is pepper. A good, good mix. So basically, we're going to put some in there. We're going to mix all that. And then we have some fresh rosemary. We're going to put that. And then I'm going to put in some lemon zest. Some lemon. Because we're doing a lemon black pepper duck. Wow. And then I also do my garlic on here. Garlic. So yeah, it's a lot it's easier. I find. Much, much finer. Exactly. So basically, this is all going to make for a nice, flavorful yeah. crust. I noticed you remove all the fat in between. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I would do with this is, a little trick is I take some parchment paper like this, mm -hmm. and we lay them down on it, and we put them in the freezer. Oh. Because we're going to cut them cut. into one inch by half inch strips, and we're going to make Strip. lardoons out of them. And so that's how I actually make the crispy part of my duck reappear on there after I've mm -hmm. cooked. So. Basically, we're going to just coat these. Mm -hmm. Important when you go to cook these is that, since we're gonna cook them in a saute pan, is that you not have your heat too high. Mm -hmm. So that's a good heat, especially when I put a few breasts in here. Mm -hmm. It'll bring it down and so we'll do three at a time. All right, so I'm cooking this as in a rolled steel. It looks like a dirty old pot, it's but okay. it's like cast iron, but it holds the heat really well. Yes. When you put them in the pan, you can see they all go whoop. They <laughs> tighten up a little. And then eventually they're going to get a crust. On one side, light crust. We're going to turn them over. And we're going to cook them for about three to four minutes on each side. So the inside is still pink. Right, it should be medium rare. And again, I sort of use my finger on these things. Like you can see right now, they're kind of flabby and they'll push in. 
When it gets firm like that, it means that they're cooked. Yes. When it comes out of there, you have to let them sit for about five to five. 10 minutes. That way the juice goes back into them. Otherwise, if you cut into them, the juice would just start running all over that, the board. Yeah, that's right. And then all your juicy meat is on the board and the meat is dry and stringy. So there's no color happening, which is what we want. Yeah. So these are my little duck crackers. Have a few. This is little duck crackers. These are good. <laughs> this is good bar snacking stuff. You know, my mother used to do this, the pork skin. Oh, with the pork, yeah. That's very popular in the Latin markets, too. Also, I like this because it adds a texture to it. Okay. Who knew that something that looks like that would taste as good as that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we have other garnishes. We're serving this with figs today because it's fig season. This is really good with <laughs> wine or beer. Great with the beer. So if you feel this, you yeah. can feel that. They're sponging up at you, okay? Yeah, sponging See how they bounce? Yeah. All right, so these just need a few more minutes to cook. And then we're going to bring them out, and then we're just going to rest them on a plate. And then we're going to accompany it with the duck hash. All right, so basically, so we just have a little duck fat in here. Yes. Um, and we're just going to crisp up the cakes. Mm -hmm. And these do spatter just a little, so you want to kind of... You see wow. how they get kind of lacy on the bottom? Mm -hmm. All of this is already cooked, so all you're doing is focusing on Focus. the crust mm -hmm. and then warming all of the meat through so it's now 140 make it, degrees. Make it nice and crispy right. outside. So basically when I cook meats, and these are considered high-end luxury cuts, mm -hmm. I salt the meat after the fact, and I'm a big fan of kosher salt. And I like it just because it's very consistent, and so I try to be very mindful where the salt mm -hmm. falls, so I want mm -hmm. to just do it on top, so that's the first thing you taste. All right, we're gonna turn these off. They're done, and we're gonna just let them rest for a few minutes. All right, so these have been resting a little, mm -hmm. and so you can see that they're ready you to slice see, yeah. because they've got that little puddle of just juice under there, okay? Mm -hmm. So what I like to do is just roll them in the juice, just briefly, and then I'm going to just salt them. Just a little touch on both sides, and then we're going to slice. You can see the kind of the pink juice coming out. Yeah, you can see. Right. Okay, and then I like to turn mine over to the upside down and I start to slice. Yeah, see how nice, nice. that is? Oh, wow. So this is pink all the way through. And also I want to slice it thin because the thinner it is, the more tender it's, it's going to feel. Tender and also you right. get all the flavor. Right, and so basically we're just going to keep slicing this and I keep letting the last slice sit on the other ones. Yeah. But you go this way. Now I have to learn to do this. So then we're going to just take our plate. So the current garnish we're serving is this endive. It's a bacon braised endive. All right, so I can just put that right on there. All right, and so then I'm just gonna turn this around because the curve's going naturally like this. All right, I should put it like this, okay. And then you just wanna fan it very lightly, okay. All right, let's oh, taste okay. this. All right, so here's the sauce. You can see how rich that is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is just the duck stock buttered with a, just a little bit of butter like a tablespoon. And you want to just sort of let it roll over there because this also will heat the meat a little. All right, we'll just put a little prettiness on the plate for you. These are just figs that we have caramelized. Caramelized. Just we cut them in half, we take the duck fat, and we just put them side down and get them kind of, you know, there's natural sugar in them. And so then we basically put a little bit of port wine on it and then just make a glaze out of it. And then this one, your favorite. Mmm. You want to sprinkle some on here? So basically you have a lot of different textures. You have a nice herbaceous breast here that's cooked medium rare. You have the duck hash cake, which has a beautiful crust on it. And now you get to eat. Okay. Well, you have to have it all together. You have to have it with the, I'll cut your little endive. Wow, real delicious. The sweet and the bitter and the salt. A little bit of fig for you too as well. I don't think you had any Hash cake is what I'm. Mm -hmm. You need some hash cake. I haven't tasted that yet. Mm, should be very tender and. Mm. So imagine that with a poached egg on it. Put a little hollandaise or put a little wine with that. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for all your kitchen wisdom. Everything's so tasty. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So good. 
Not much slows you down, honey, I'll tell you. <laughs> My partner, Greg, was just telling me how you were out doing tequila shots with him to like two in the morning. I, I, and Corey Lee came when in. When I was and, young, I can drink a lot. I can, <laughs> I can drink straight whiskey, scotch, and scotch, uh, uh -huh. There's a picture I see of you in my mind. I've got your blue jeans on, you got your thumb in your pocket, and a glass of champagne, and you're leaning up against the counter, and you're like, <laughs> woo! <laughs> I don't know where I get that, probably maybe from my father. From your father, huh? Yeah, my father always have a little wine, a little... Uh -huh. He Something knew the secret the for food. longevity, mm -hmm. huh? He really know how to enjoy the uh -huh. life.